Hi, welcome to International Hawaii. I'm your host, Cindy Matsuki. International Hawaii showcases local import and export businesses to help others new to the industry. It's such a complex industry, so the more advice we can share, the better. Today, my guest is Chris Pierce, founder of World Sake Imports. They're a local import company and an FTZ9 tenant. Woohoo! Hey, Chris, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So I wanted to ask you about World Sake Imports. Like, could you briefly tell me when and how you got started? Well, you know, um, Hawaii has a deep history with sake. And uh, the first sake brewery outside Japan was made in Hawaii in, uh, in 1908. Honolulu. I didn't know that. Nice. Yeah, and uh, there was a, a leading business of the Japanese community here before the war. And uh, after the war, um, it started up again. And they were lucky enough to have an amazing uh, technician, research technician come from Japan to help them learn to make sake again. Mm -hmm. uh, and it kind of like thrived uh, after the war. And it kind of like generated a sort of a community of sake lovers, you know, sake drinkers. So I was, I was actually the founding member of the International Sake Association wow. in Hawaii in uh, 1984 was, was when it started. And uh, through that, I got to know Nihei-san. And, um, you know, we would have events and we would bring sake back from Japan and we would enjoy it, you know, and think it was great. But we could never get sake like that in Hawaii. Mm. Uh, the regular importers at that time, they just want to eat that kind of sake here. They would usually ship it to uh, LA in an un unrefrigerated container and it would stay there in an unrefrigerated warehouse. By the time it got to Hawaii, it was in bad shape. And oh. then it would just sit in a warehouse here. So, <laughs> just, you know, was, sake is quite delicate. So you, you can't treat it that way. And uh, so I kind of got the idea to just start bringing some sake in here because we couldn't get good sake in Hawaii. I didn't have a big business plan. <laughs> <laughs> it was more for personal reasons. I just want to bring more in. <laughs> so that's kind of yeah. how it started. Yeah. But we... Uh, I think uh, we registered as a company in 1998 and we brought our first shipment into Honolulu uh, in 1999 for, wow. uh, for an, I think it was for a moon viewing party that we had at the Japanese consulate here. So that mm -hmm. was kind of the kickoff. I think our first shipment was uh, maybe 60 cases or huh. so. And these days we, we probably move around maybe 3,500 cases a month. So the 60 cases, did that come by air? No, it came, it was shipped it by sea. And wow. uh, um, at that time, we probably started with, with uh, FTZ at that time. Oh. I'm pretty sure they were our first, they were there for us, you know, from the very first shipment. And so we, you know, we brought it into the FTZ and although, you know, they don't have refrigeration, they do have, they do have a cool area for the cool mm -hmm. because of the refrigeration. So that was good. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we couldn't have started here without more trade flows. Very grateful to them. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. Um, was it? How did you navigate like just the importing when you first started? The importing is not so bad. You just have to have a, a license to import alcohol okay. into the United States. That's a federal license, and then you have to have a state license in Hawaii to sell the alcohol. So mm -hmm. those are the, the two things that are required. But on the Japan side, it's fine um, because uh, the exports. Uh, when sake is exported to Japan, documents have to be filed with the National Tax Administration because taxes um, are assessed to sake brewers in Japan. They have to pay an alcohol tax, um, wow. but that's waived when it's exported. It's kind of like an oh. induced. Mm -hmm. So all that paperwork has to be done and all that tax deferment has to be calculated. And it's not the kind of thing you can do yourself. You have to have an agent in Japan to do that. So uh, we do have a very good agent in Japan and uh, sort of a family friend. And uh, they, they took that part over. So we were able to do the Japanese side quite well and the, and the US side quite well. And we had been introduced to the brewers um, by the, the wife of Takao Nihei, the, the brewmaster I told you about earlier, who'd become a, a close friend. And so when we said that we wanted to bring good sake in Hawaii, she said, okay, I can make some connections for you. And she did, and she connected us with a few of the most famous breweries. And I, I guess it's just, uh, you know how it is if you have an introduction from, you know, someone that is respected, you know, it goes a long way. So that, that's what helped us, you know, connect with the, 
the breweries that we represent now. That's amazing. And so the technician moved to Hawaii from Japan? Yeah, it's an amazing story. Um, if you want to read more about it, you can go to the Hanaho website. There's a, they have uh, this, this issue has an article about it. There's even a video. Oh, about perfect. It. But uh, yeah, he, um, he was the one that was appointed to go to Hawaii in 1954. Because after the war, they, they just couldn't make the sake well anymore. Too many of the people that had worked in it had retired, you know, the equipment, you know, hadn't been used for a long time. And sake means working with microorganisms, you know, and so starting everything from scratch wasn't easy and they, they couldn't make good sake here. Mm -hmm. And so they brought Nihei-san over to be their consultant. When he got here, he just couldn't believe what terrible shape things were in. <laughs> And wow. he wasn't confident, you know, that he could solve all the problems, but it's amazing what he did. And um, he was the one that developed the, you know, the kind of techniques for making sake from California rice that were later followed by the big Japanese breweries when they went to California. And he had lots of innovations that he did so that he became famous in Japan as wow. a research coach. And it was actually, you know, given a big award and everything. And um, so, yeah, that, that was... Uh, you know, that sake was such a big part of Hawaii in those years, and it still is today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, did a specific sake company bring him over? Yeah, or was it the industry? industry? It was just, oh, there okay. was just, at that time, after just the war, there was only one that started up like this, only one that was big enough. And uh, during the war, they had made shoyu, they made miso, you know, they made other mm -hmm. things uh, just to keep mm -hmm. going. But mm -hmm. after the war, they wanted to get right back to sake. And, they make it on a big scale. They were selling a lot of it, and not only in Hawaii, but they exported to California too, and sold wow. a lot. It was a big business, and uh, and so they needed somebody that could really mm. on, on a large scale. Mm. Okay, so when you so you found your suppliers from your connections, and then how do you find the buyers? Like who do you who are you selling your sake to? Mostly to restaurants, you know. In, in our case, although because of COVID, now we're respecting the stores a lot more you know the retail stores because so many more and more people are, you know drinking at home oh now. yeah we mm -hmm. started out the um a, a companies that would provide sake and in hawaii um there's a lot of japanese owned japanese restaurants i mean you don't always find that if you go to a city on the mainland there might mm -hmm. be japanese restaurants but maybe the owner's not there mm -hmm. but here the japanese owners were here and they recognized the name of the breweries that we represented because they were famous you know, Masumi, De La Zakura, Koshino Kanbai, you know, these types of breweries were well known, you know, to anybody. And uh, so we, we, we didn't have much problem meeting with them. And also because we were bringing the sake into Hawaii um, in, a, in a reefer container, so it was refrigerated, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, we were selling it quickly, um, the, the sake was in amazing fresh condition. And mm -hmm. there was no comparison between our sake other sakes that were available to other distributors. So we quickly established those sakes there. Wow, that's such a great story. And did you, how did you find um, the restaurants or did they find you or did you kind of go door to door? And uh, find... You know, I think in sales, you really have to call. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, you, you know, you, yeah, the best way we found was to kind of concentrate on the best restaurants that are respected by other restaurant people. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if there's someone, uh, someone like that, then, you know, if they carry it, then others say, okay, well, it's, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's and then involved. it's just a word of mouth. Oh, yeah, must be okay, you know. So we started out with Kurosato restaurant, and uh, they were a big restaurant group. They had four restaurants, I think, at that time. They still have the oldest Japanese restaurant in Hawaii. It's, it's, it's left uh, it's on Kalakawa, right at the corner of the Hyatt huh. Regency. So it's called Kurosato still. It's the oldest uh, Japanese restaurant on Oahu, as far as I know. And, but at the time they had other ones too. And they, uh, they, they right away, you know, got all the sake and put it in the restaurant. So uh, <laughs> that was the start for us. That's amazing. And then are you guys now exporting anywhere? Uh, we, we have offices in uh, New York and in um, San Francisco and in London. And wow. we have rep sales representatives working with home office out of their home offices in Miami and Las Vegas. So yeah, we've kind of expanded. Probably <laughs> probably 85 or 90% of the sales are now outside of Hawaii because they're, those are much bigger markets. That's amazing. And is it pretty much the same importing from Japan to these different locations? Pretty much. I mean, once you once we started, 
exporting to New York, we didn't send it from Hawaii to New York. We, we would arrange a direct shipment. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, that, that was uh, okay. I mean, in Hawaii, you don't run into problems with, uh, you know, not, not very often, you don't run into problems with, uh, you can't get your cargo unloaded because the workers are on strike, you know. Oh. <laughs> there's a slowdown or something. Mm -hmm. like the Teamsters on the West Coast, that's happened a few times, you know. Wow. Where they just, you know, and so then it just backs up everything, you know, makes delays. And right now, you probably know there's an international shipping meltdown. Mm -hmm. There's a shortage of containers. Um, our shipments now are at least five, our, our shipments to New York and to the West Coast are five weeks late. Oh. You know, they, they tell us arrive, and when it actually arrives, it's like five weeks later. And it's probably not going to get any better for a few months. So that creates enormous problems because, uh, you know, you have people wanting to order sake and they can't do it. And then once the shipment finally arrives, you have so many back orders that it depletes all your inventory and you're, you're out of things again, you know, just after the boat arrives. Wow. So that's kind of what's going on right now. But it has I mean, I... Hawaii. And Hawaii, Hawaii, um, Seems to be a little bit protected, you know, because it's it's. I don't think it feeds into the international shipping schedule quite quite as much. It seems to have a, they go back and forth in Hawaii and Japan, you know, mm. and so that's been pretty regular. But even so, they canceled all the April ships to Hawaii, so there's no shipments coming in Hawaii in April from Japan. Wow. That I know of, you know. Who is your shipper that ships direct from Japan to Hawaii? They consolidated recently. That the, Ocean Network, something like oh, that. Oh, one. One, yeah, but they're like a, a monopoly. Mm. And they were formed by a consolidation of three, uh, three Japanese shippers. Now they're owned out of Singapore and the service has really deteriorated. And it's not oh. the same level of Japanese attention and service that existed in the past. Oh, that's too bad. Just but any business has its headaches. You know? And it's, yeah, I think the number of shippers that will come direct to Hawaii is minimal yeah that's maybe the they're the only one <laughs> i heard about uh one coming from hokkaido a ship oh. comes from hokkaido and brings rice and stuff huh. like that oh. i guess there's other than two yeah but not it's hard to find oh we have a um, question from one of our viewers they're asking is your main market demographic japanese people or do other no, it's not. It, 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 maybe in the beginning it was more that way, but mm -hmm. uh, it, now I think it's it's really sake has been accepted, not only mm -hmm. in Hawaii but you know in in main market centers in the United States. They all they all have a lot of good Japanese restaurants. And mm -hmm. Anybody that walks into a Japanese restaurant, I mean, they, they're kind of like positive orientation to order sake, right? If you're mm -hmm. a Japanese, <laughs> yeah. <restaurant. laughs> yeah. So um, it's really it's really the American. Americans that are that are driving. It has it has a self self sustaining momentum now, self sustaining growth momentum. Uh, you know, it's interrupted by things like COVID, but normally it grows by you know, and it's been growing by eight, ten, twelve percent a year for a long time. Hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, what a great market to be in. I wanted to ask for our our new importers. Did you ever have any problems with your import shipments coming in? Do you have any horror stories about anything getting held up? Uh, you know, I really haven't, you know. Um, That's good. I really haven't. Um, yeah. <laughs> there, there's horror stories, but they had nothing to do with uh, what happened to the sake after it, you know, landed here. <laughs> how it landed in Hawaii. We haven't. We haven't had any problems with customs, uh, not really, and uh, nothing's ever been held up. You know, so, no, well, we're quite happy. You know, I'm, I'm, I love that our, even though even though we we sell sake, like all in the United States and Europe, um, I'm really happy that our headquarters is quite. Right. That is great. So, is it is it a growing thing on in Europe? Sake yeah, we just opened uh, World Sake Imports EU. Uh, perfect timing right before the pandemic mm. so it's, it's kind of on hold right now but but we have everything in place we have a we have a, a, a company a, a, it's in germany that our branch company is registered and uh, all of the paperwork is fine we're registered as a german corporation uh, we have a warehouse and we have refrigerators we have delivery and we have salesperson so it's all wow. kind of 
on hold right now for COVID. Huh, that's amazing. We are gonna take a short break. And this is International Hawaii on ThinkTech, and we'll be right back. Hi, welcome back to International Hawaii. I'm Cindy Matsuki, your host, and my guest today is Chris Pierce. He is the founder of the World Sake Import, Import Company in Hawaii. And we're talking about um, how he's established his business and found his customers. But he also has another business that he also runs, and I have no idea how he manages his time. But you also publish and run Hanaho Magazine. This is the magazine that you can find in Hawaiian Airlines. Yeah, we were... Um... We were always in the publishing business first. We had a <laughs> magazine in Hawaii. I started doing magazines in Hawaii in the early 80s. And wow, so this is before the whole sake thing. Yeah, before the whole sake. And so um, that's actually how I met uh, Nihei-san. I think I, a, a, a Japanese uh, reporter took me up to visit him one time. So, uh, but yeah, I've always, I've always done magazines. And uh, I like having, I think when you live in a place like Hawaii, which is so dependent on things that happen in other parts of the world mm -hmm. um, that it's good to have two businesses somehow managed you know this mm -hmm. was this this was told by me by um, our guam our first distributor was on guam for world sake import and, and he told me he said chris you know it's really a good idea to have two businesses if you can. he said we have two businesses we have we have one in guam and we have one in saipan and when the typhoon hits saipan mm -hmm. wipes everything out we still got guam mm -hmm. and when the typhoon hits guam you know, and wipe it out, <laughs> you got sight pad, you know. So I never forgot that, you know. And uh, I think it's pretty good advice actually, you know, to try mm -hmm. to have, if you can, you know, try to yeah, have hedge people. hedge your businesses. So um, we thought we were gonna kind of uh, get out of uh, publishing and just concentrate on the world sake, but then Hawaiian Airlines um, kind of like um, knew about us and approached us about uh, their in-flight magazine. And then we, you know, we said, we decided we wanted to do it. And so we've been doing it for the last 21, 22 years. That's amazing. I love the magazine. I mean, I don't know how you find like those specific stories that are so amazing. Like Yeah, we've never repeated a story. Out. And it just goes to show you what kind of a place Hawaii is. You mm -hmm. know, how many you know, experiences there are here and how deep and rich the culture is. I mean, it's just endless. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I was going to ask, like, how do you maintain your relationship with your suppliers like are you in japan a lot visiting and oh yeah i'm usually going there uh i would probably go four times a year four or five times a year i always visit each brewery at least once a year but we're good friends by now you know it's not all of them you know there's there's you know i mean i get invited to the weddings you know and, you no. know things like that and so um uh it's just I, it's just a really really good relationship with every single one of them i think That's... they just regard us as part of their company almost that's wonderful. <laughs> and then you mentioned how the pandemic has kind of slowed restaurants down. And how did your how did you change the business to, well, to that manage? Was, yeah, we like everybody else, we didn't really see it coming. I mean, mm -hmm. we kind of oh, heard yeah. about it, you know, January, February, but we but then uh, then in March, by end of March, it was starting to hit big time, right? Mm -hmm. New York and our, our major major markets are California and New York. And they were, both of them just got slammed. And then by the last 10 days of March, the sales were heading down. And then, and then by, um, by February, 
February and April, we were probably just at like 15% of our normal sales. So we applied for the PPP funding mm -hmm. and we got it, you know, and so that that enabled us to keep everybody on salary. And the salespeople that depended on commission, we put them all on salary. So we didn't have to let anybody go. We, we wow, that's great. Um, we've just, and then we tried every way we could to try to, you know, get sales from the, out of the situation that was there. If they only have takeout, we would have a takeout menu for sake too, you know, and if they mm -hmm. wanted to offer something special, we would make it, you know, we always had something going on, some kind of promotion that mm -hmm. we could take around. And actually that reacted to our benefit because people really appreciated the effort that we made, mm -hmm. you know, to help, you know, to try to find some way, you know, to, to move that. And mm -hmm. now that it's lifting up, I mean, we're seeing like a lot of the business just pour back in. Uh, this month, this March was a big month for us. I oh, great. We recovered like that's good. How far ahead do you have to plan? Like a month or two months as far as, you know, ordering? And... Order from the time we order the sake to the time we get the sake. If it's like New York, let's say, or West Coast, it'll probably be about three months. And wow. then, yeah, it's a long period for the ordering, right? You have to order it and then mm -hmm. the brewery has to deliver it and it's got to stay in Japan for a while while various huh. people and stuff like that. So um, by the time we, by the time, from when we order it to when we sell it, I would say it's probably about four months you know, before we turn it around, you know, that kind of wow. business. Wow. Yeah. So were you ready? Like, did you kind of predict around now is when business would start picking up again? And so you've been kind of- I kind of thought it would get better in March, in March yeah. But I, I mean, I didn't think it would get this. this but there's, a, <laughs> there's clearly a lot of pent up demand, you know? <laughs> and uh, uh, that's one thing is uh, the I think the with with sake you know it's something that people go out to restaurants they have a good time mm -hmm. you know as soon as they can get back to that they're gonna want to get back to that you know they're gonna want to go out to a restaurant maybe they formed the habit you know over the last eight months of uh, or last year actually of, of not going out you know and that it's gonna take them a little while to start going back to restaurants it's not a habit anymore mm -hmm. but I think the habit will be reestablished you know maybe by June or so. I think mm -hmm. that I feel like May and June, uh, April and May are going to be kind of like intermediary months. But if uh, if the vaccine keeps rolling out like it is, and if no really crazy variant, you know, mm -hmm. diseases pop up, it should be really really strong economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope Just so. Taking evidence of how much people want to drink, you know, which I think is a good indication. Did you see an increase in like? Um... Not restaurant, but store sales. Like, do you yeah, distribute yeah. to? We went out. We got a lot, lot more st stores would contact us, and we contacted more stores. We got a lot more retail customers, and the mm -hmm. percentage of the retail sale went up significantly mm -hmm. uh, compared to the restaurants. So that's probably mm -hmm. probably not that true. And but you know, it, it kind of um, you know, if we always read these stories every few years, every five years. Saying, well, sake, you know, that's it's now established. You know, it's now part of life. You know, mm -hmm. in the United mm -hmm. States, and it never really quite seems to happen. You know, it always seems to be like this fringe thing that people get just when they go to Japanese restaurants. But as a result of this pandemic, it might very, very well have happened. You know, this time, <laughs> you know, we'll see. You know, but uh, you know, because of buying it in the retail stores and stuff. But, um, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's sake, sake is really great. I mean, and, and the more you learn about it, uh, the more you appreciate it. And, as you drink a variety of sakes, you know, from many different breweries, you know, that are always in like perfect condition, you know, and it really mm. people really get into that, you know, and they, they want to learn more about it, you know, try different ones, you know. So it's, education has always been a big part of our, you know, uh, mission, if you will. Mm -hmm. Are you doing any B2C sales, like either Pardon? online or um, uh, like? No, we, don't, we don't do it ourselves. No. Okay. Um, we never got around to it. <laughs> and now it seems, it seems like there's so many other people doing it, you know. And I would be I would be, be a little bit cautious too, because I mean it is a business after all. And and just because just because you're able to, you know, put your own sakis online, you know, at a reasonable price and maybe even arrange to ship it, that doesn't mm -hmm. mean you have a business because you mm -hmm. have to do all the other things you have to promote, you know, you gotta keep upgrading your website, you know, you gotta be aware of what your competitors are doing, you know. You have to have somebody that's really in the middle of that, you know, running an online retail business. So I don't think uh, someone like us 
you know, mm. importer and a distributor, you know, should do that. <laughs> Better to have yeah, order. that's true. Better to have larger customers with less yeah. orders, but larger orders. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we continue to work with lots and lots of restaurants. Yeah. That makes sense. What are um what are some of the biggest challenges that World Sake faces? Like is it hiring or is it shipping? Um really the um the the worst thing that could happen is uh, foreign exchange fluctuation. Oh, huh. yeah. So for example, uh during the during the meltdown, uh financial meltdown in mm -hmm. 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. uh, that just slaughtered the dollar. You know, so nowadays, uh, with with one dollar, right? With one dollar, we can buy 110 yen worth of sake. You know, mm -hmm. now in those days, with one dollar, you could only buy 80 yen worth. Wow! So we the dollar was, and so, but on the other hand, you're in the middle of a recession, so you can't raise your price to cover that because, you know, the, 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 your customers are barely hanging on. You can't go and say, "Hey, we have a crisis." So you just have to suck it up and be able to lose money, you know, for years. That's one mm -hmm. of the good things about you know being in business for a long time. If something like that happens to you, you know, in the first year or two, you might not survive it. Wow. But the foreign exchange can really slam the world. And mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. you know, it mm -hmm. coincides with a, a bad economy in the home mm -hmm. country. That's why, you know, that's why the dollar is weak. Wow, that is tough. Um any advice that you would share to somebody just starting out? I think it's great to love your product if you can, you know, mm -hmm. you know, so you have that natural enthusiasm and that you like talking to people about it. And share, <laughs> you know? and so every time you go visit a potential customer on a sales visit, you think that you're doing them a favor, right? Luckily <laughs> you, you get to buy this great stuff that I have, you know, it's going to make your business better. It's going to improve that makes sense. the quality of your, of your, you know, of what you sell. You know, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, you want, you want to be able to communicate that kind of enthusiasm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at least in the consumer area that, that we are in. That's great advice. I love that. Um, where can, where can people find out more about your, your sake and your company and your events? We have a, we have a, a website, worldsake.com. Uh, we're very involved in the joy of sake. Uh, that's the world's biggest sake event uh, outside Japan that's held every year and it's been held in Hawaii for 20 years now it started in 2001 we couldn't have it last year because of the pandemic you know it just it wasn't allowed but we're hopeful to have that one so uh that's it that's the that's an amazing incredible sake event usually there's 500 uh different sakes all of which you can taste if you oh, want to. You I know, need to go to that <laughs> it's self service sake and there's usually about 20 restaurants to prepare sake <sighs> Are you planning to host it this year? Yeah, we can't wait. As soon as as soon as the governor you know, loosens up, you know, and lets us have public events again, we'll we'll, we'll schedule it for sure. We have it's at the convention center. The uh, if that's where we have it. That's on, great. Up, or in the ballroom. Definitely let me know about that. I'll help share the news. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> we appreciate that. Yeah. Chris, I want to thank you so much for all your advice and sharing stories on International Hawaii with me, and it's been. A real honor having you on our show and we'll see you next time on international hawaii and think tech okay thank you so much for inviting me i enjoyed it thanks chris